before moving to the next speaker, I invite again all the participants to submit questions in the chat box at the right hand side of the screen. And I will address the question to the speakers at the Q&A time. Next speaker is Neil Stevens. He is a sociologist based at Brunel University London. He's been conducting a project tracking the emergence of cultural meat as a novel ca category since 28. Neil Stevens' presentation focuses on the current global context of cultural meat and charts some of the technical, regulatory and political challenges it raises. Over to you. Hello, hello. I'm very pleased to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Neil Stevens. I very recently joined um, the University of Birmingham. As you heard, I'm a, a sociologist who's really interested in this emergent technology called cultured meat. Uh, there's some images of cultured meat on the side. I'll be showing you some more. And I'll be talking about uh, how this technology has come into being, what people want to use it for, and then thinking about some of the broader political, technical, cultural challenges around what the, um, the emergence and potential uh, application at scale of this technology could be. So, I'm just, there we go, there we, oh, it's, there's, sorry, there's a little lag on pressing the buttons and the slide changes. So, we'll start here, uh, late last year. Um, this is an image of the first meal paid, well, the first set of meals paid for in a restaurant where the people were eating cultured meat. It happened December late last year uh, in Singapore because Singapore became the first country in the world to legalize this technology, to put into place a regulatory system that allowed companies to sell it. It was sold by a company called Just Eat, uh, uh, sorry, um, Eat Just, um, under the name of Good Meat. That was the name of the, uh, the branding. And it's chicken nuggets. They sold small numbers of chicken nuggets uh, in a private member's restaurant. Um, so meals of sort of five people at a time, only a couple of times a week. Why so infrequently? Because this is still very difficult to make and very expensive to make. They were selling it, they certainly weren't making it at, at a profit. I suspect they were, they were selling it at quite a reasonably sized loss, in fact, uh, really as an opportunity to demonstrate that this technology, cultured meat, which is, which I'll tell you what it is in more detail in a moment, is something that is to be taken seriously. Why do you need to convince people to take it seriously? Because it sounds completely unusual, completely strange. This is a technology where essentially, instead of killing an animal to get meat, you take a small volume of cells from a living animal or a recently deceased animal, and you grow them in controlled conditions with a medium in a bioreactor to grow muscle tissue, which you subsequently form into initially the shape of a processed food, be that a sausage, be that a chicken nugget in this case, that you then consume as meat. So on this uh, slide, there's some papers that describe in more detail how this works. Um, essentially, you take a, you, you can pick any species. It doesn't have to be, you know, typically eaten species, but generally all the companies are mostly focused on reproducing familiar meats be it, uh, from fish as well that you would find in the supermarket through a cultured mechanism you need to have this culture media and what that culture media is where you get it from and how much it costs is really really important to all of this because um that's one of the technical difficulties i mean it, basically it's expensive some of them have got animal material in them and you don't really want to have animal material you want Increasingly, the companies are moving towards animal-free culture media, the stuff that you grow the cells on. Um, and, and, you know, that's one of the technical issues. You would then put it in these big bioreactors. They might well look a bit like the sort of things you would see when you're brewing beer. 
um, where first of all the cells are proliferated, so you start with a very small number of cells, and then you grow them up to get lots of cells, and then you put them probably in a different culture media, so this time to uh, differentiate them, to turn them into advanced stage muscle tissue like you would know. This is of course technology from biomedicine, right? This is akin to regenerative medicine, akin to stem cell science, the idea that you can grow cells that you would put in your liver or wherever within your body to give you a healthy function. This is doing it to make meat. I've been using the word cultured meat, but there's actually quite a lot of different words that people use to describe exactly the same thing. And some of them are much more appreciated within the community. Cultured meat, cell-based meat, cultivated meat. These are the, some of the words that people who are trying to produce it like. There's a whole other set of words that people use like fake meat, synthetic meat, Frankenstein meat, which I'm sure you can imagine people in that community are less keen on. Um, because there's a politics here and there's, there's, a, there's the setting up a framework of meaning, a, a framework for understanding this really novel and different food stuff, working out if it's meat, working out if it's something that you want to eat. The first time it was uh, eaten in public was in August 2013. Uh, the burger that you can see here, produced by the man you can see here, who is Professor Mark Post from Maastricht University. They held a press conference in London that I was lucky enough to attend, where they cooked a burger and fed it to two journalists, basically, who tasted it for the first time, live streamed around the world with a, with a, a great many uh, news reporters there as well. They said it felt like meat, but it, the, the taste wasn't quite there. But for the community, this was really important in, in establishing the concept. Then in 2015, we saw the first company come in um, who really have gone on with this. A company at the time called Memphis Meats recently changed their name to Upside Foods. And they released this cultured meat ball that they produced in San Francisco, uh, with San Francisco Bay Area, in, uh, in a lab for startups. And this is important not just because it's a new, this is really the sort of second high profile public eating of cultured meat, but also because it showed a, a change in the institutions that were producing cultured meat. Mark Post at Maastricht was at a university. These were in a startup. And that captures a change that's happened within the community. People have been trying to do this since about 2000. The early work was all in universities. They struggled for money. Since about 2014, 15 onwards, there's been a very real shift to kind of a, a startup company culture, often funded by venture capitalists who are very um, welcome to take on financial risk for high reward gains. And a lot more money has come in and the kind of the culture of the community has changed somewhat. You see a much more aspirational rhetoric now. A lot of people giving big talk because that's the type of thing that motivates the, um, the cycles of finance that they operate in. And here's some examples. So this data is now um, uh, like a, nearly a year old, but you can see the amount of money um, that was publicly announced in cultured meat companies since 2015 to 2020. And you can see there's a real uh, rate of increase. If we have the figures for 2021, I'd anticipate that rate of increase to go at that same kind of level. There's companies around the world, there's a great many in the US, uh, and actually a great many of the ones in the US are also around the San Francisco Bay, Silicon Valley area. Um, but increasingly we're seeing them across the world in other places as well. Asia is increasingly uh, becoming a, a place where we're seeing new companies being formed. Some of these are really big, some of these have about 100 employees, some of them are still just sort of four, five, six people, depending on how recently they started and how successful they are. Just, of course, is on the market, but I have to stress that really is not a commercially viable product at this time. Even though it's technically being sold, it's, uh, it's expensive. And those chicken nuggets were grown on something called uh, fetal bovine serum, which is essentially uh, sort of a, a product produced from the blood of fetal calves. It's not, uh, it's not a vegan product if you're using fetal bovine serum. And that's a big issue because there are a number of reasons why people who make cultured meat are suggesting that this is something that we absolutely, definitely should be supporting. Um, and one of those is absolutely about animal ethics. It's the idea that this is a way to make meat 
that involves killing significantly less animals, maybe killing no animals. Um, and of course, we know that there's a huge number of animals killed uh, every day around the world for people to eat them. Uh, for many, this is a, you know, an absolute moral catastrophe. And this is something that if we can do without, then we absolutely should. There's also the idea that this is a way of uh, producing meat with a much lower environmental impact. So using less land, that seems quite clear cut. You don't need the land to graze cattle. You also don't need the land to grow the feed for the cattle. There will be a land footprint, but, the, but it, it seems quite likely that would be much smaller. But there's also the idea that it could well use less land, that's right, use less energy and less water. And because of that, uh, produce lower greenhouse gas emissions than producing uh, meat through live animals. Bit more of a question on that one, really, because this is still very much a hypothetical system, uh, how it will operate at scale, not just operating the, uh, the the bioreactors, and these will be factory sized facilities, you know, they would be huge if you're genuinely going to replace all meat production around the world, which is the aspiration for some, you're going to need an absolutely huge number of these factories, you've got to build them, you've got to run them, and that requires resources. There are people who conduct LCAs, life cycle analyses, to look at what the environmental impact of this technology could be. The outcomes vary. They vary quite widely. And of course, they vary quite widely because it doesn't exist at scale yet. So even when people are doing LCAs of actual practices that exist, you still get variability in your findings, depending on the methodology. When you're trying to predict a system that simply does not exist on any at any kind of scale, you know, the numbers become become difficult. There's an idea this would also be a healthier meat, which would be free from uh, zoonotic diseases, which is something, of course, which is, uh, you know, diseases that transfer from animals to humans, which is something that, of course, has framed us quite significantly in recent times. And also uh, a way of producing meat potentially with much less antibiotics. And also the idea that you can have innovative foods. You hear less about this, really. Most people, most companies are trying to produce exactly the same thing you would see in the supermarket now. But it gives the opportunity for making meats that look very different, as well as there has been some work thinking about this as a way of making meat in space, uh, particularly for long term space travel, as well as, of course, a way of making a lot of money either for a company or for a national economy. Let's look at some more pictures. So these are some sausages produced oh, oh, three or four years ago now by a company called New Age Meats. These are based in uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So those sausages, these were the first sausages they made, or at least in pub and publicly released for like a tester session in a, in a bar, basically, in the Mission District in that part of the world. And um, they're only about, I believe, only about 10 percent cultured meat. The rest of it is sort of a plant based filler that you because actually, you know, a lot of sausages have uh, in the shops today will have additional fillers in them, perhaps not quite as much as that one. Um, but people quite like the taste, apparently. I mean, they, they only cooked, they had about 20, 30 people there generally eating it, and they only cooked a small number of sausages. You know, you can see these little bits they're cutting. Each person got a little morsel um, because that's that's where the technology is. Uh, this is wild type who make uh, salmon. And these are their salmon sushi dishes. Um, there's a lot of these really nicely taken um, photos. Uh, it's kind of like something that a company has to, the universities didn't have, didn't do this, but the companies tend to feel they have to show these very sort of nice looking enticing images, really to give the sense to people that this is real delicious food and not something um, to worry. We, we've heard in the previous talks, right, all about risk and notions of naturalness, all highly relevant here. Um, and this is uh, bacon made by a British company, Higher Stakes. Um, they're, they're working in pork belly at the bottom. These are all grown in the lab, basically. This is an image by another company who make fish in uh, San Diego called Blue Nalu. And I have to be clear, this is this is not this is a facility that they're anticipating building to make cultured meat. It is not a facility that they are making right now. This is something that they see in the future. It's indicative of where they want to go. It's important I say this because I don't want to give you the impression that cultured meat exists on this scale, but it gives you a sense of the aspiration. In the text, they say they've developed this plan for commercial production uh, of cell-based seafood. Their 150,000 square foot food facility is designed to serve a population of 10 
to 20 million people and they plan to build facilities around the world. I've seen a map where they show images of these in like major cities all across the globe. Uh, the aspiration for the volume is, is, um, it is huge. It's, it's enormous. And this is just one company. There's there's about 100 companies in the world doing this right now. And this is their image of the inside. And you can see kind of on the right hand side, the essentially the cells and the culture media will come in. You can see that there's so it's, it's the right hand side in the 3D rendered image. It's the left hand side in the 2D rendered image. Uh, you can see the circles with blue. Those would be the bioreactors where the cells are expanded. Then the, the kind of the light blue floor room, that's the production facility where they would shape it into familiar products. And then at the end, you can see there's the store where the lorries take the uh, take the products away. So this is really one facility, cells and media go in, uh, fish for the supermarket come out the other side. But there are technical issues. Uh, you know, the, one of the things that I said, the startup culture, recognizing that is important because that's a culture in which people have to give very bold, confident visions of the future. But getting there is difficult. So there's issues about deciding exactly which cells you're going to start with from the animal. Um, a huge one, really a lot of these are, are related. There's there's the medium, what, I've, what I mentioned earlier, the liquid that you use that has all the nutrients that encourage the cells to grow and encourage the cells to grow into the right type of cells that you want making that medium animal free, making it environmentally friendly, making it cheap and cheap. Remember, culture media is used in biomedical settings. People will pay a lot more money for a tissue engineered, you know, piece of cornea or, or kidney tissue, whatever it is, than they will for a sausage in a supermarket. So you're taking a technology developed in an expensive environment and having to make it very cheap. So how do you scale this up? How do you design your bioreactors and how do you automate it all? And that's related to the medium because your bioreactor might be a bit different with a different medium. And then biomaterials. So this is other things you put in that could be a scaffold. So things that the cells grow onto to give them shape. There's also a huge number of questions about what might happen in the real world if the scale up is successful. How does it change the food system globally? Um, you know, will it be successful? Will people eat it? Will people see it as desirable? Um, there have been uh, surveys and focus group studies looking at this, and certainly there are there's a diversity of opinion, but certainly there are some people who are keen to try this. They tend to find that younger people, better educated people, males. Uh, and people who live in urban environments are more likely to say that they are uh, willing to try it and would like to eat it more regularly. Um, but equally, there's a lot of people who find this problematic in all kinds of um, ways. There's also a lot of questions, as I've already been talking about, in the environmental impact in terms of really how much energy do you need? But also there's the issue of if you can make it, not just, you know, not just is a kilogram of cultured meat so much better than a kilogram of meat where you killed the animal to get it. Um, there's a broader issue about, well, what impact does it then have on the food system? Because cultured meat really doesn't really work from the environmental argument unless the increase in consumption of cultured meat uh, has an equivalent or greater reduction in the production of livestock meat, right? Cultured meat only works by shutting down farms. That's how it works. That's how it addresses environmental impacts. You have less farms producing animals, particularly cows and cattle, which, uh, uh, which have an environmental impact. That's the logic. But if people, but we have a growing population, right? So if, if um, livestock farming continues exactly as it is, and we have cultured meat and we essentially just have more meat, um, or, or, or cultured meat goes up and, and livestock meat goes down at a different rate, you know, it becomes more, again, it becomes very complicated about exactly what would be what would the impact of all of this be. There's also very real economic issues about the impact on the food system. Um, you know, what happened if you see that kind of sectoral change and really our rural environments can no longer rely upon uh, livestock farming as, as, as part of their economic structure. Uh, what happens to people's lives? What happens to people's jobs? What happens to communities? Do we need to be thinking about a mode of just transition, which is a way of taking people into new sectors, but being very aware of their the economic needs of families and communities? How does this impact on the concentration of power? Is there the chance that we will really see just, just a very small number of companies running food and meat across the world? 
and how does this impact on people's identity when they're buying meat? Does it change notions of like what it is to be vegetarian, for example? And then there's the uh, regulation issue. And as I said, it has now legally been uh, regulated in Singapore and lots of other countries are also pushing this. The key issue is how do you make sure that it's safe? How do you inspect a facility for building it and make sure that there's no contamination or anything like that? And then how do you label it? What can it be called? Can you call it meat? Do you have to say that this is like a strange type of meat or can you just say that this is meat? And what kind of promises about the environment can you allow people to make? Lots of issues. That's my 20 minutes. Happy to talk more in the discussion. My name is Neil Stevens from the University of Birmingham. Uh, I, I hope that was interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting um, presentation. And we had such a broad overview on culture meat. And we are all eager to see European consumers reactions where culture meat will be finally available on the European Union market.